Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Jack Reitrick, and I'm a pediatric cardiologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Welcome to Pediatric and Congenital Heart Talks, a series of lecture presentations and discussions on interesting and important topics in our field of pediatric and congenital heart care. In this series, we will share insights on a variety of topics, offer new perspectives on some basic principles, introduce novel concepts and innovations, as well as identify what needs to come next to solve challenging problems in our field. Our objectives are to provide education on a variety of topics, but also perhaps to stimulate some provocative thought on your part. We'd love to hear from you and to get your questions and thoughts on these discussions. You can contact us at this email address, chopheartalks at email.chop.edu. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. It's somewhat unusual for us to have developments that are paradigm shifting uh, in our field. What you're going to hear in the next few minutes is a talk on a circulation that we have to a degree forgotten about or perhaps might remember from our textbooks but really haven't explored within the context of congenital heart disease. The speaker you're going to hear from is Dr. Yoav Dori who is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine, and the Director of the Jill and Mark Fishman Center for Lymphatic Disorders. Yoav is a pioneer in the field of understanding the lymphatic circulation, and in particular within a context of congenital heart disease. This has opened a tremendous new perspective on cardiovascular conditions, and again, having this uh, understanding within a context of congenital heart disease is offering tremendous insights into our understanding of pathophysiology and the treatment of conditions that we thought perhaps were not treatable previously. Join me in listening to Dr. Dory, and I look forward to hearing his, uh, his talk. Yoav. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for having me over here. It's a, it's a pleasure to come and talk about uh, my favorite subject. So, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Reichek said, my name is Yav, and I am uh, currently the director of the Jill Mark Fishman Center for Lymphatic Disorders. And we're going to be talking today about uh, this uh, lymphatic circulation as it pertains to congenital heart disease. As uh, Dr. Reichek said, uh, central lymphatic flow uh, disorders and or physiology was studied extensively in the 1970s. And then there was about a 40-year hiatus uh, where the circulation, for all practical purposes, went away, and for that was known as the forgotten circulation. And the reason that happened is that there was really an absence of any easy way to image the lymphatic system. And there was really not much you could do about it. So people said, you know, I can't see it. I can't do anything about it. Why don't we just ignore it? But I'm happy to say that, uh, yeah, we are definitely back. Uh, <clears throat> the lymphatic uh, system plays several key roles. And we will not talk about all of them today. There is the defense role. Uh, which is the key uh, role in immunology. That is the part of the lymph system that is still studied in medical schools. Uh, but in the different medical schools, people spend about 20 to 30 minutes studying about uh, all of this. It has a very important transport role. So when you eat long chain fatty acids, uh, they are transported actively inside the lymphatic ducts and ultimately make their way into the venous circulation uh, and into the liver, turning into the LDL, HDL, and all the cholesterols that we know about. And there's an extraordinarily important circulatory role of the lymph system, and that's what we were going to be concent uh, concentrating on today. Lymphatics plays a role in many cardiovascular uh, diseases, and there are more and more of them now that people have finally recognized uh, that this is the case, and there's more papers that are coming out now that are uh, discussing this. There was a recent paper that came out, a uh, very nice paper that showed the role in formation of scar in patients, uh, who, in patients or excuse me, in animals. Uh, these were mice who had uh, myocardial infarctions and showing that scar size is diminished 
uh, when you in induce angiogenesis, lymphangiogenesis. It clearly, lymph clearly plays a role in atherosclerosis, but also plays a role in things that we don't think about, for example, hypertension. And uh, we've known for a long time that it plays an important role in rejection. And actually, the first heart transplants, T-cell depletion through lymph drainage was the only way for us really to control the transplant rejection. So it plays an important role there. One of the most uh, common diseases in uh, the Western world, and something that is the leading cause of morbidity or mortality, is uh, congestive heart failure. And the end result of many patients with congestive heart failure is this fluid overload, or this thing called ascites. And we now know that uh, dysfunctional lymph circulation is responsible for this and playing a key role in, uh, in causing this. So we're talking about this lymph circulation. So this is the slide that I always use to uh, explain what lymph circulation looks like. In general, there are lymphatic channels everywhere that there is a blood capillary, there's a lymphatic capillary, and the lymphatic capillaries act as a sponge. So fluid is, is transferred into the tissue by the arteries. It is collected by the veins. But about 10 to 20% of that fluid is corrected by these lymphatic channels. In addition to that, there are very, two very important uh, lymphatic streams. There's an important lymphatic stream coming from the liver that's especially important in heart failure, as you can see over here. And then there's an important stream coming from the intestine. That is the stream that carries the chylomicrons and uh, the fatty acids that we eat. Uh, under normal conditions, fluid uh, flows from the different organs up into a central channel of going up here called the thoracic duct. And in most people, drains to the uh, subclavian uh, uh, IJ junction, usually on the left side. Under normal physiological conditions, the system carries about two to three liters a day. But in patients with heart failure where uh, lymph production in the liver can increase significantly, the system uh, can handle up to 15, 20, and maybe sometimes 30 liters a day of fluid. And that causes some of the problems that we are uh, facing. There are many factors that affect uh, lymph production and lymph flow. Many of them we don't really understand. As I said, you know, the system was forgotten for a while, so we didn't spend uh, much time studying all these factors. Unlike the cardiovascular system, where we really know many things and have many drugs to treat. But everything that affects the cardiovascular side also affects the lymphatic side. So everything that we do in intensive care units, everything that we do with ventilators, all the medications that we give surely have effects on lymphatics. We don't know all the effects. We don't know how uh, some of the medications can increase or decrease lymphatic flow. Uh, but these are things that we are now uh, currently actively studying. And we won't go through all of these. We're just going to show one that is extremely important for patients with heart disease, and that is the effect of uh, CVP. So this problem with CVP, which is central venous pressure, uh, especially affects our patients with single ventricle physiology who are going to live an entire lifetime with an elevated uh, central venous pressure. But this also affects all the patients who have uh, heart failure because ultimately most patients with heart failure will develop what's called right-sided heart failure and that will lead to uh, elevated central venous pressure. So if you are born with a single ventricle, then you most likely have normal CVP or relatively normal CVP. And that means you have normal production of lymph in the liver and you have normal drainage in the venous angle. Undergoing the process of single ventricle palliation at uh, around six months, you will undergo the gland operation. And when you do that, what you're doing to the lymph system is you are increasing the afterload on it because the pressure in the veins where the lymph system is draining into is now increased. And it's equivalent to putting your finger on a garden hose and, uh, and blocking it that way. So that increases the pressure. And that already is causing lymph congestion. And we see that in these uh, patients. 
we don't see a lot of lymph ab uh, flow abnormalities or leakage in these patients, although we do see, and now a growing number, is because their production is still normal because their pressure in the veins that the liver sees are still normal. But when you convert a patient to a fontan, which occurs usually around two and a half years of age, now you've hit the system with two bad things. So first of all, you still have the high pressure in the outlet, so you still can't drain, but now the liver sees high pressure and is starting to produce enormous amounts of lymph. And this double problem of high production and poor drainage uh, it ultimately causes severe congestion and causes problems to show up. Now we know now that the abnormal physiology plays a huge role in this, but it is not the only condition uh, that causes the problems that we see. And we know that our uh, patient population have some kind of lymphatic susceptibility. Uh, not all patients with an elevated central venous pressure are going to have leaks from their lymph system. Some patients with very high central venous pressure uh, will have none. But some of them develop leaks even when the central venous pressure is relatively low. And what we think is occurring, and we actually know that this is occurring, at least in certain cases, is that they have a certain problem with their lymph channels. Lung lymphatics are supposed to drain from the lungs towards the thoracic duct and then up or connecting directly to the veins and then draining directly into those. And what we see in a lot of our patients is that their lung lymphatics can flow in the opposite direction and they flood the lungs with lymph that ultimately leaks out. So this abnormal anatomical variant, uh, together with the abnormal physiology, ultimately leads to this entity that we call lymphatic failure and to a lot of the problems that we're seeing in our patient population. As I said, the reason why this circulation was forgotten is because we really couldn't do much about it uh, and we couldn't see it. So the first thing that we did, and that was about seven years ago now, is develop the tools to minimally invasively image lymphatic anatomy. And some of those tools were available before we got into this uh, uh, lymphatic circulatory business. But there was really no good technique to look at uh, lymphatic flow. We could see anatomy, we couldn't see flow. And if you're dealing with a circulatory system, you have to understand, in order to completely characterize it, you need to be able to understand anatomy, you need to be able to understand flow, and you need to be able to understand physiology. So you need to get in there, measure pressures, and understand what it's doing. The first technique that we developed, uh, and we published this a while ago, we, started, we did this first in, uh, in animals, in pigs, uh, and uh, figured out that it could work. And this is the notion that you could do what's called intranodal dynamic contrast lymphangiography. And this is a simple technique. We've now taught many people around the globe how to do this. And that is just injecting uh, contrast into lymph nodes in the groin and following it over time as it's going up into the lumbar lymphatics showing over here into the cisterna chile and into the thoracic duct and then ultimately into the vein. And what you see over here where my mouse is pointing right now, these are the lumbar lymphatics. This is the thoracic duct draining over here to the left. And this is what a normal uh, intranodal lymphangiogram should look like. It takes about uh, 10 minutes to get this picture. Very simple to do. But as I showed you before, there's these very two important streams. There's a stream coming from the liver, and there's a stream coming from the intestine. And historically, even though we had a way to look at the central lymph system, we didn't have a way to look at these very important streams. And I'm happy to say that we've now developed the techniques to do that. So we recently, this was about a year ago, introduced the notion of intrahepatic dynamic contrast of angiography. And we do this now routinely in all our cardiac patients. And what we do is we access the liver, access the lymphatic channels in the liver with a needle and inject contrast over there. And you can see over here and in principle what the liver lymphatics should flow from the liver through the pancreatic lymphatics and drain to the cisterna chile and then go up. And this is kind of what normal looks like. So this is an injection in the liver and you can see contrast going to the retroperitoneal lymphatics and then going up into the thoracic duct and this will ultimately make its way to the left side and drain. And the more recent technique which has now completed all the imaging that we need to characterize the main 
uh, lymphatic streams, the central lymphatic streams, is uh, what we now call intramesenteric lymphangiography. This technique is a little bit more complicated. We uh, have just started now teaching other people how to do this. Uh, <clears throat> but this uh, requires getting access into lymph channels in the mesentery and then uh, injecting contrast in there. And again, mesentery should also connect to this sac called the cisterna chile and then make its way to the thoracic duct and that connects again to the left. And this is what a normal uh, image looks like. So this is the mesentery over here. The needle is sitting somewhere over here. We inject contrast. You can see contrast is going up. It eventually uh, courses posterior, connects to the cisterna chile, which sits over here, and then lights up the thoracic duct and goes to the left. So we now have all three streams that we can routinely measure, and many of our patients are now getting three points of access when they come to us. When we talk about lymph failure. There's different uh, types of lymph failure. And there's lymph failure that we think about that is clearly due to lymphatic problem. And we now know that these entities over here, uh, one is uh, called protein losing enteropathy, plastic bronchitis, and chylothorax, that uh, those are, uh, we now know, are strictly a lymphatic problem. Okay? But when we talk about lymph failure, there's other things that we have not historically necessarily thought were a lymphatic problem. And those are things like ascites and edema, and we now have some evidence to show that these are also a result of uh, the lymphatic system uh, failing, causing this. And even though PLE and plastic bronchitis and chylothorax are relatively rare diseases, ascites and edema is much more common and is something that most of our uh, single ventricle patients and all of our patients with heart failure eventually are going to experience uh, some of these problems. In addition to that, there is some evidence that uh, the lymph system plays a key role in uh, some of the things that we see in our uh, chronic heart failure patients, patients with single ventricle physiology, and that is end organ damage. So, as again, as we said, most likely playing a much more significant role in many different diseases that we don't completely understand. And part of what we have done now is develop the lymphatic diagnostic tools and the lymphatic treatments that allow us to treat uh, all of these. Dysfunction of the peripheral lymphatic system, so these are the lymph channels that are present in the skin, uh, was studied by a friend of mine from Denmark. Uh, she is a surgeon, her name is uh, Vibika. And they have shown that even the peripheral lymph system in patients with single ventricle physiology is dysfunctional. And they did it by uh, using uh, isocyanide green, which is a fluorescent dye, and a near-infrared camera, and looking at what lymph flow looks like in these peripheral lymphatics. And they have shown that in patients with single ventricle physiology, it's not just central lymph system that is dysfunctional, but clearly central, the peripheral lymph system is also dysfunctional. Uh, you can see things uh, like shown over here in the graph that the pumping pressure in patients with Fontan is lower, so the, their peripheral lymph system can't squeeze as well. And their uh, contraction frequency is higher. So if the channels in the skin whoops, excuse me. if the channels in the skin can't squeeze that well, then in order to move the same amount of fluid or more fluid, they just need to squeeze much quicker. And there are other things that are occurring in the peripheral lymphatics that are dysfunctional that we won't go through today. When we talk about central lymphatic disorders in our population, and this goes for the single ventricle patients, but also for all the other patients that we are dealing with. It is not just single ventricle patients that have problems. I usually like to divide them as problems that are occurring in the thorax, and problems that are occurring below the diaphragm inside the belly. And the things that we see in the thorax are these three entities that are shown over here. So on the left, you can see here, this is chylothorax. So this is fluid leaking into the pleural surface. Chylopericardium, so this is fluid leaking into the pericardium. And plastic bronchitis, this is lymph fluid, now we now know is leaking into the airway. And in some ways, these are kind of the same entity. They're caused, in most cases, by the same problem. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. They are caused by this thing called pulmonary lymphatic perfusion, or we've termed it pulmonary lymphatic perfusion. People call it different things, but it is this flooding, as I showed before, of the lungs. 
And we initially identified five different lymphatic anatomies that can cause this. And the only reason to do that really is that the knowing the anatomy really dictates how we are going to approach the treatment for this. So type 1, type 2, and type 3, they are the ones that have connections to the lung, but have a central thoracic duct that is connected to the vein. And in all possible, we try when we do treatments for these patients to preserve that uh, connection because the patients will need the thoracic duct. Uh, in order to uh, carry all this fluid. So we try to do what's called SLD or selective lymphatic duct embolizations when we treat these patients. Type 4 and type 5 patients are patients who don't have a thoracic duct connected to the vein, so there's not, there's not that connection to preserve. And in these patients, we can do a little bit more aggressive uh, treatments, what we call TD or thoracic duct embolization if we need to. But there is new options for some of these patients, and in some of them, we can reconnect. So if you have a thoracic duct, like in a type 4 patient, that is going up, but it's just not connected, we can do a lymphovenous anastomosis, and I'll show a little bit later what that looks like, and we can reconnect the duct and uh, reconstitute central lymphatic flow, and that's extremely important for these patients. And then there's an additional type that we've identified recently, and this is what we call the uh, liver to lung type. And we've now found that there are multiple patients who have connections directly from the liver into the lung, completely bypassing the central lymph system. And again, this is one of the reasons why multimodality imaging is ex extremely important for these patients. And it can cause all the problems that we've seen with some of our population. So this is what this pulmonary lymphatic perfusion looks like. If you remember the image that I showed before of a normal thoracic duct, then clearly you can see that this is not a normal thoracic duct. Uh, you can see uh, here, first of all, there's uh, multiple ducts that are coming up. There's at least two of them. And then there's all this white stuff that is showing up in the lung. This is this pulmonary perfusion. And actually, the airway sits right over here. So this is flooding of the airway, flooding of the lung, okay, which you can see over here in the cross section of that. And this is liters and liters of fluid that is going towards the lung, flooding the lung in these kind of patients. And the lung has to be able to absorb them. So this uh, problem has enormous consequences, right? Your lungs are going to be wetter. Ultimately, there's a, there's a potential that you can leak because of this. This abnormality in the thorax is something that we can screen for, and this was published not too uh, long ago in 2019 by us. And what we did is we looked at a very simple imaging technique, which doesn't look at flow. It's T2 uh, MRI, which just looks at fluid. And this technique was uh, used uh, uh, years ago to look at lymphatics. It doesn't show you, again, flow. It shows you anatomy, but it can show you this abnormal pulmonary perfusion, this wetness in the lung, because of the big contrast between air and fluid in the lung. And we've characterized the findings that we see in the thorax in these patients. And there are patients who have what we call a type 1, type 2 abnormality. And those are patients who really don't have too much of an abnormality in the chest. It's more above the clavicles that they have a little bit of this uh, high T2 signal or edema. Patients who have type 3 abnormality, those are patients who have uh, abnormality that is extending into the mediastinum. And patients who have type 4 abnormality, like the previous image, are patients who have abnormality or this whiteness that is extending into the lung. And <clears throat> what we have found is that those patients who have type 3 and type 4 abnormalities have a very different single ventricle palliation outcome than patients who are type 1s or type 2s. And that's shown over here in the data. So if you are a type 1 or a type 2 patient, you are going to do very well as a single ventricle palliation, as far as we can tell. As long as your cardiovascular side is fine, so as long as you don't have a very leaky valve or you don't have a, a myocardial dysfunction, you're going to undergo the single ventricle palliation pathway. You're going to do well through those three stages. And as you can see over here, the patients with type 1 or type 2 underwent a Fontan completion. That was the majority of the group. So there's 53 patients of the entire cohort. And they went in and out of the hospital very quickly. Their hospital stay was very short, and they all completed the Fontan, and, and none of them really had any complications. Uh, 
If you are a type three patient, then you will have completed your single ventricle palliation and you can get through it, but you're not going to get through it without any problems. And these patients who are type three, so the stuff is extending into the mediastinum, those are the patients will have a tendency to leak. So they will have a higher rate of calothorax or a higher rate of pleural effusions, but we can get all of them through the palliation, get them out of the hospital, and overall they can do uh, well. If you are a type four patient, then you have a serious problem. These patients, not many of them were able to complete the Fontan palliation. These were the only group of patients that ultimately needed a Fontan takedown transplant, and the only group of patients where patients died after the palliation. Now within this group of patients, there is a subset of patients with type four that clearly we think now should not undergo a single ventricle palliation because they have a really, I think, a genetic a channel problem that we cannot uh, easily fix. But there are a subset of patients with type 4 that we now know because we've done it that we can treat and potentially get them through the pathway. We don't know in the, how they are going to do in the future, but we're hoping that they, some of them at least, will do okay. As I said, if you have a, uh, a connection to the vein, then at all possibility, we would like to preserve that. We didn't talk too much about how we get into the thoracic duct. That was the other component of the reason why this is a forgotten circulation. But now we have very good techniques to access the thoracic duct, to do interventions. And if you do have a thoracic duct and connection to the veins, at all if at all possible, we would like to preserve that. And this is an example of a patient who presented with a, uh, both plastic bronchitis and uh, a chylothorax. And this is what a selective lymphatic embolization looks like. So you can see here we have a catheter. This is actually a two catheter technique. So there's a small catheter here and another catheter going into a large channel that is going into the right lung and then ultimately perfusing both lung fields. And you can see that we've glued this channel selectively. And uh, after the gluing, you can see this is, we put contrast into the thoracic duct. You can see the thoracic duct actually is going up like this. And there's two connections, one connection to the vein on the right side and one connection to the vein on the left side. And in this patient, the problems that we were dealing with completely resolved after we shut this channel down, preserving central lymphatic flow. So this is the goal for therapy, if at all possible, to do that. This is the <coughs> other part of the treatment. So this is getting these effusions to resolve. And this is a paper that we published in 2017 in Jack, talking about patients with chylothorax uh, that were treated. So we had a cohort that was a relatively small cohort at the time. There were 16 patients who had this pulmonary perfusion uh, or a leak. And then there was this other group of patients who had this thing called congenital lymphatic flow disorder that we are not going to talk about right now. We'll talk about it a little bit later in the context of a multi-compartment limb failure. But patients who had a pulmonary lymphatic perfusion problem or a leak, okay? And the number of patients with leak is actually really, really, really small. We initially thought that because patients undergo surgery and then they start to leak into the pleural surface, that, uh, that most likely the problem was because the surgeon somehow cut the thoracic duct and now they're leaking. But it's really almost impossible for the surgeons to cut the thoracic duct. We, oh, out of these 16 patients, only two of them had a real leak. And usually it's a leak coming from a lymphatic channel connected to the pericardium. Uh, the thoracic duct was intact in all of them. Uh, but really the number one cause of these entities of plastic bronchitis, chylopericardium, and chylothorax is this pulmonary perfusion. And uh, with these kind of treatments, with either selective embolizations or total thoracic duct embolizations, in addition to some conservative therapies of diet and medication, 100% of those patients, we can get these effusions to resolve. And that still is the case today. And back then, in 2017, we only did 16 patients. We're, we're, we have much, uh, many more patients that we've treated now. And that still is the case, almost all of them, almost 100% almost of the cases we can get these, this problem to resolve. And that is very different than this multi-compartment problem that, again, we'll talk about later. And uh, in addition to resolution of calothorax, you can see that all these patients that we treated ultimately survive. So 100% of them should be able to survive this. So this is very good news, calothorax outcome. Historically, this is a huge problem and now very treatable problem. 
And that goes also for this entity. This is the other entity. Uh, in chylothorax, as I said, uh, fluid leaks into the pleural surface. In plastic bronchitis, fluid leaks into the airway. And this was one of the first diseases that we really figured out how it works and develop a treatment option for it. And historically, plastic bronchitis was really a deadly disease. Kids that got this uh, had a very high mortality, and all of them needed to get a transplant, and not many of them survived that. So the mortality was almost 50%. And what we've discovered from doing our studies is that plastic bronchitis is uh, caused by lymph draining into the airway. This is what plastic bronchitis looks like. So it's just proteinaceous material sticking to itself, causing these casts. So this is proteinaceous casts that have exactly the structure of the airway. And you can see over here on the right, this is these peribronchial lymphatic channels that are stained in blue. So we injected blue dye inside the thoracic duct. And these uh, blue channels, these are the lymphatic channels surrounding the airway that ultimately they pop and some of the fluid will leak in. You can see even that white dot right over there uh, as we're going with our camera that, ca that causes the plastic bronchitis because if you have a lot of fluid leaking in there, uh, you'll get these casts. We figured out that we can treat that, again, using the same treatment mechanisms that I showed you before. So these are the patients, and this is data that we have now collected, and we are working on writing that. Hopefully, this paper will be done soon. Uh, but this is 70 patients with Fontan physiology uh, <coughs> who underwent plastic bronchitis treatment. And this is what this uh, cohort looked like when they came to us. Many of them were casting daily. Some of them were casting weekly, some monthly. Uh, and there were none of them that were not casting at all. So the frequency of casting varies between patients, but there is most of the patients have a regular kind of interval at which they cast. And after treatment, this is what it looks like. So almost all of them are now at a point where they are not casting anymore. Okay, so that is a huge difference. And <clears throat> when we did this, there were still a few patients that had cast despite our treatment. And I'll show you in a second why that is the case. I think we've discovered uh, uh, why that occurs, and we probably have treatment uh, for most of these patients. So really, somewhere around 90 to 95 percent of patients who have uh, plastic bronchitis, uh, you can get a hold of the casting process, resolve their symptoms. And, and once you do that, they are actually many of them are very good Fontan patients. Okay. or single ventricle patients, or what, whatever they are. that We've actually treated now patients with Tetralogy of Fallot who have uh, plastic bronchitis. And again, once you treat it, they do well. And the most important thing, and that is the huge change here, is as I said before, historically, the outcome for these patients was poor. Uh, and this is the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve for a plastic bronchitis patient now. And it actually looks very similar to what a Kaplan-Meier curve should look like for a regular Fontan patient. So about 80 uh, to 90 percent survival, about 80 percent survival at uh, up to 40 months. And we've now, uh, this was done again, uh, the data was collected a while ago. So uh, these patients are further out now and they're still all of them surviving. And as I said, historically, this was the Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, this was published by uh, people in Michigan, uh, Schumacher and people in Boston. And you can see that historically, the survival was very pu poor with about a 50% mortality at, uh, <clears throat> due to this disease. So really, a complete frame shift or uh, transformation of the disease. Uh, uh, thankfully, the, most of these patients can now survive this. This is the reason why some of the patients that we initially were doing the imaging and treatment, uh, we couldn't get plastic bronchitis to resolve, because as I said, there are a subset of patients where have this connections directly from the liver into the lung, and that can cause plastic bronchitis. And uh, initially, when we were doing our studies, we were only doing intranodal infangiography, so we were not seeing these connections. Okay. And so, there was not much uh, that we need to treat. But even if we did see some abnormality coming from the central lymph system, you can have liver to lung connections in patients who also have thoracic duct to lung connections. And this is what this can look like. So this is a patient. You can see this is intranodal lymphangiography. And you can see the intranodal lymphangiography is completely normal or a little bit dilated lumbar lymphatics, but the thoracic duct is going up. There's nothing connecting to the lung, and it is draining. You can see it even here, draining into the uh, vein on the right side. So nothing causing pulmonary perfusion. But in this patient, as you can see over here, this is a needle in the liver. 
right down over here. And you can see we found the channel that causes the problem. And we injected glue into it. And you can see there's a channel coming from the liver through the capsule of the liver going up and connecting directly to the peribronchial lymphatics on the left side. And in this patient who was casting daily, once we glued this channel, his plastic bronchitis completely resolved and he's doing well. So I believe that we can treat really most of these patients uh, and uh, cure their problem, either having chylothorax, chylopericardium, or plastic bronchitis. So we started talking about the liver part, and we're not going to talk too much about everything that is occurring in the belly. This is all relatively new things that we are discovering because, as I said, the imaging techniques to look at all the uh, problems in the belly were newer than the intranodal lymphangiography. And intranodal lymphangiography hasn't really showed us uh, the problems that occur below the diaphragm. But intrahepatic imaging and intramesenteric imaging are key for this. And the two most common problems that we are seeing are this entity called protein losing enteropathy. And the other thing is ascites. And we won't talk too much about ascites because that's even newer because intramesenteric imaging is key for a lot of this. Uh, but protein losing enteropathy is uh, the equivalent of uh, the leak that we talked about in the thorax in these patients Lymph is coming out of the liver instead of going in to where it's supposed to go, making its way to the cisterna cali and the thoracic duct. Lymph is going, and what we see is this reversal of flow of the lymphatic channels that are connected through the pancreas into the duodenal wall, and ultimately we see lymph leaking into the duodenum. Okay? In ascites, the problem is a little bit different. Right. And our understanding of this disease is, uh, is newer. Uh, but we do see in some patients that there are leaks from different components or different parts of the mesentery into the uh, peritoneal space. And I'll show an example of one of those. All right, and this is what intrahepatic uh, dynamic contrast and fangiography looks like in a patient with protein zinc enteropathy. And this is really the imaging technique of choice for these patients. And in this patient, you can see we inject the liver and the contrast immediately is spilling into the duodenum, which you can see right over here. And then contrast is also refluxing back into the stomach. And over time, contrast continues in this patient to reflux back and then starts to move forward. So it is moving to the other parts of the small intestine, but also making its way into the esophag esophagus. And uh, in this patient, actually, you can suction the contrast out of the patient's mouth. So this is enormous amounts of lymph fluid that is just spilling into the duodenum. And ultimately, it's going to make its way out of the body. And this is, again, the imaging modality of choice for patients with protein losing enteropathy. We think we can use this imaging modality to actually screen our patients for those who are potentially susceptible for protein losing enteropathy, and we now have evidence uh, that uh, is starting to support this notion. And what we did is we recently looked at all of our patients who underwent intrahepatic dynamic contrast of angiography, all of our single ventricle patients. And those were patients who came in for PLE problems and those who came in for not PLE problems, so for chylothorax or plastic bronchitis. And you can see that all of those patients who have protein losing enteropathy have either leak into the duodenum, which is the majority of them shown over here, or they have perfusion of the duodenal wall. Right? But there are no patients with protein losing enteropathy who don't have one of those entities. In contrast, most of the patients who don't have PLE don't have perfusion of the duodenal wall or leak. Okay? Out of the entire cohort, only two patients had perfusion of the duodenal wall. And interestingly enough, one of those patients went on about four to five months after our imaging uh, to develop protein losing enteropathy. Okay? So a huge difference between these different cohorts and a potential way for us to screen all the patients that don't have protein losing enteropathy and make sure that they don't have those circuits as we go and do an intervention. Because if you do have protein losing enteropathy and a problem in your thorax, right, shutting down the thoracic duct doesn't make any sense because you now have what we call a multi-compartment problem. And that requires a different way uh, of thinking and a different way to treat them. This is what protein losing enteropathy looks like from within the duodenum. So the streams that you see over here with black arrows, these are actually lymph streams, these clear streams. 
And what you're going to see over here is the equivalent that we show with plaster bronchitis. We inject blue dye into the liver. And you'll see uh, this is uh, the, the streams coming in from the duodenal wall. So we actually see these. These are actually holes that have eroded into the duodenal wall. And you can see when you inject blue dye into the liver, you can see the blue dye spilling into the duodenum. And this is, again, it's, it's enormous amounts of lymph that are just spilling out. They carry the protein with them. They carry T cells. They carry immunoglobulin. They carry all those things that our patients uh, with protein-losing enteropathy are deficient in. The good thing about this is now that we've understood this, uh, <coughs> we can uh, treat, in some patients, treat this. And one way to treat it is just shut down these uh, holes using uh, glue. And this is a patient where we did this. So uh, we do this together with our uh, GI uh, attending, uh, who's looking at us injecting uh, the glue. And you can see uh, right over here, this is glue drops that are going into the duodenum through a huge hole in uh, the duodenal wall. And we know that that's the duodenum because if our GI doc is going to uh, <coughs> flush uh, fluid into the duodenum, you will see that these drops are just flushed out into the, that's the uh, C loop of the duodenum right over there and going into the rest of the intestine. And we know that if we do this, if we shut down these holes in the duodenum, then albumin and all those uh, things that these patients with protein-losing enteropathy are deficient in will normalize. The other thing, and we'll end kind of with this, is this uh, ascites. Um, and there's many things that we are now just learning about this. Uh, but ascites is a huge problem for some patients. And there's, again, new imaging techniques that we've developed not too long ago. And this is one of those patients. And this patient underwent contrast ultrasound lymphangiography. And you can see this is, again, injection of contrast into the liver. And you can see that in this patient, the contrast is spilling uh, right over here. And in this patient, we did glue these channels and the ascites, again, uh, resolved. So there's new treatments that we can offer these patients. <clears throat> the multi-compartment limb failure is just taking all these different problems and combining them together. This is a huge problem. It's a problem that many of our patients are going to face and requires a different way of thinking about it. So instead of just shutting down different channels, it requires us to shut down selectively some channels, but then decompress the system. One thing you can't do in these patients is shut down their thoracic duct because you will lead to more significant problems. So again, as I said, selective embolization is the way to do this. Multimodality or multi-compartment imaging is key to diagnose the different problems, and that's why all of our patients get these, the intramesenteric, intrahepatic, and intranodal, and each one of them can show us different things, like this patient over here. This is a leak from the liver. The mesentery showing us different problems, and the intranodal is looking uh, pretty normal, but showing us some of the lung problems, as shown over here by the arrows. One thing we can do for these patients, as I said before, is connect the thoracic duct if it's not connected. So this is a surgical hybrid lymphovenous anastomosis procedure, and we've done this in several patients with good results. So this patient did not have a connection, and what we did is we took the external jugular vein, connected it to the thoracic duct. This was uh, not too long ago published, and reconstituted central lymphatic drainage, and uh, in patients this works. Another thing we can do for these patients, and this is also relatively new stuff, this is what we call the Haraska procedure, initially developed surgically by Victor Haraska, who is currently in Wisconsin. And this is the notion that instead of just blocking things, you can actually decompress the entire system by just connecting the innominate vein directly to the low pressure part of the circuit, which is the atrium in this case. If the Fontan pressure is, for example, 12, then the atrium should be at a pressure that is a little bit lower than that. And we've now developed the techniques to do this uh, percutaneously, and that was developed. We call this now the Rome procedure, so developed by uh, Jack Rome in our institute. And we can do this percutaneously for all the different kind of single ventral anatomies. And the result of this procedure, when you combine it with selective embolization, is actually very good for these patients. So many things that are coming down the pipeline that will help us deal with all these different problems they are facing. One additional thing that we have now, are now working on and we actually have some very good results with is this notion of precision lymph lymph lymphology. And that is the notion that there's this genetic problem 
okay, that is causing the problem in addition to the physiological problem, and that this genetic problem or susceptibility problem is driven by abnormal genes. And if we discover them, then we can tailor our treatments precisely to the problem, including interventions that can be tailored, but also medicines that can be tailored. And there's an article that we recently published showing how a certain drug, which is a mechanibitor, that can be used to treat very severe lymphatic abnormalities in patients with heart disease who have Noonan's uh, syndrome, for example. And this is one of those patients, and this is really the last slide uh, of the talk, except for the summary, who had a very severe problem uh, with intractable protein-losing enteropathy and, and GI bleeding in addition to chylothorax. And we treated this patient with trametinib, which is a MEK inhibitor. And uh, shortly after treatment, the hemoglobin level and albumin level completely normalized. The central lymph system completely remodeled, and we were shocked that this actually can happen. So apparently, we do have an organ in our body that can completely regenerate, and that's what happened over here. You can see this is what it looks like before, and this is after. And this is what the gut mucosa looks like before and after. So this is what causes the protein-losing enteropathy. This is vascular and lymphatic ectasia and this very edematous mucosa that ultimately was leaking protein and was bleeding, and after treatment, that completely, completely normalized. So these are things that are coming down the pipeline that hopefully will allow us to treat our patients. So I'll summarize by just saying that lymphatic flow disorders are serious. They are life-threatening disease, diseases in a lot of our patients. Prevalence in our patients with congenital heart disease, not just single ventricles, is relatively high, and there's much more that I am sure we are going to discover in the future about the synergy between lymphatics and the cardiovascular system. Imaging is key, and we now have a way to image the most important compartments, and new lymphatic treatments are now available and are coming down the pipeline, and I would like to thank everybody uh, and say as long as we keep on working on it, there will always be hope for our patients, and we'll end there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Yoav. That was a, uh, a fantastic uh, summary. Uh, you know, every time I, I listen to you uh, give any lecture on this topic, uh, there are so many things that I learn uh, from you and uh, from your group's experiences. Um, you know, uh, it almost seems to me as if we've been uh, traveling along a particular pathway, uh, from my perspective, as it relates to single ventricle care. And we're plugging along, and there's tremendous friction and resistance to making progress. And then um, every so often, not often enough, but in this particular circumstance, something comes along, your particular interest, you open the door, and it's as if a new room uh, is available to us, an entire new perspective, an entire new realm of how to look at particular problems. And in observing, uh, how you and your group have developed your understandings in a relatively short period of time. What I think is, is so fascinating is how you learn from each and every patient. So it's, it's the initial experience. Okay, we take an observation, we learn something, we incorporate it, we build a layer, we go on to the next patient. Another little new nuance, build a new experience, learn something else. And it's, it's been really wonderful for me to observe how this entire uh, realm of what you're doing uh, has started out with a couple of grains of sand, but now we've got uh, a growing mountain of information. Uh, and again, driven by each individual patient that you see. Every patient uh, himself, herself, is, uh, is, is, a, is a, an opportunity to learn something new and variable as it relates to the lymphatic circulation. What, what I want to ask you is what, what do you think is uh, the most surprising thing that you've learned so far? I would imagine that, that each one of these patients opened new uh, vistas for you uh, initially, but, but looking back at the last six, seven years that you've been doing this, what, what's been the most fascinating thing? And what do you think has been so far perhaps the most impactful finding that you've noted in these patients? So I, I think the most uh, surprising thing was how little we actually knew about all of this, that all of this was happening, right? It's been happening for hundreds of years, and we really knew nothing about it, right? I mean, I, as I was going through medical school and going through my pediatric cardiology training, 
I had no idea. I've never heard of limb system. I didn't know that it was important for anything. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and it was there, right? It was doing what it was doing. There was, there was suspicion, right? And as I said, 50 years ago, and one of my mentors, uh, her name is Marlies Witte. She's one of the original lymphologists who's absolutely an amazing human being who uh, is head of the Ignorance Society. Uh, they studied this, so there was something, there was hints. But yet we ignored it. And in the pediatric cardiology world and congenital heart disease world, we, we literally ignored it. And then when we started talking about this to people, again, like you said, right, there's initially there was a lot of somewhat a lot of resistance, right? Because people were, OK, wait a second. I mean, you know, we've been doing congenital heart disease for a while. We've done perfectly fine. Our outcomes for, for doing surgeries have been, you know, pretty good. But yet there are still patients that are somewhat sick. But we were always focusing on that cardiovascular side, right? And there was this whole side that was, uh, for all practical, practical purposes, kind of ignored. So that was the kind of the most surprising thing about it is just how little everybody knew about it. And also the most fascinating thing about it, because that is, to me, and that is the way I've kind of lived life, is always an opportunity. It's an opportunity to be curious, an opportunity to understand ignorance and to be humble about something. In addition to that, uh, one of the biggest surprises was actually, you know, the role that lymph is playing in some of these diseases, right? So like diseases that we now know how lymph system is playing a key role in, like plastic bronchitis and building loose enteropathy. You know, there was some suspicion. We thought, okay, you know, there was, there was many other factors, and there's still many other factors, but, but to see how lymph actually plays a role in that and actually to see leaks into the airway and into the duodenum, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating, and, it's, and it's, it was extraordinarily surprising. You know, we did not expect uh, to see these things, and it just kept on happening and happening. Just every time we were looking, we were seeing uh, new things. And the last thing that I would say as far as the surprising part is the plasticity and that notion that this lymph system, and that gives really hope for everybody that has lymphatic abnormalities, even things like lymphedema, right? Is that lymph system can, it looks like it can regenerate. And we see this by giving them some of the drugs that we've given and see that the central lymph system completely, completely remodels and it takes about a one to two months to do that. So if we can find what is causing the problems in these patients and give them a drug or some kind of treatment that will target that, you know, the hope is that, right, we can make a lot of this just go away, right? And yeah. that would be the best, right? The, my job is to make sure that I have no job at some point, right, that people will just be well. Yes, I, I love your mentioning of the, of the ignorant society. I am a, I'm a lifelong member of that particular society. Uh, and uh, I think what's, what's important to appreciate and sort of, again, observing the development of discovery is to, to constantly question your biases. And that even though we think we exist in a world today, as you say, our, our outcomes for congenital heart disease continue to improve, but we have reached some impediments and we have stumbled. Um, there are some particular areas that we're perhaps we're not making as much progress in. Right. Again, the single ventricle population uh, we've come a long way. We've defined a pathway for survival, but we don't yet have the, the pathway for a normal quality and duration of life for this particular population. So the ability, again, to have this jump onto this new track, this new right. perspective, uh, and explore that has is, is just been tremendous. Um, something else that, I, that I've noticed as well, uh, just in, in listening to your talk also, and, and the, the development of these tools have been so eye-opening. And uh, the, the ability to uh, uh, create this understanding as well as the treatment strategies are so dependent upon these tools. You mentioned a little bit about the, the training aspect, but to what degree do you think that these tools can be disseminated widely enough so that it's not just our center here or perhaps some other select academic centers, but, per, but truly that this becomes part and parcel of our management and understanding of cardiovascular conditions, both congenital heart disease as well as adult. What, what needs to be done from a training or a dissemination perspective in, in your view? Yeah, so I mean, you know, that is one of our, uh, our purposes as physicians, right, is the dissemination of knowledge, 
right? So we have to do that. And it, just like anything else, it can be done. I mean, we do open heart surgery, right? We take the heart, we, 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 we stop it, right? Sometimes for 40 minutes, freeze patients down, right? And then sew these tiny hearts and, and that knowledge is disseminated, right? Yeah. There's nothing special about me, right? Or, or my team over here, right? I'm just- Well, simple. I would disagree with that, but <laughs> no, go ahead. Yes, I get your point though. <laughs> Literally, absolutely nothing special about me. I'm a simple human being like everybody else. If I can learn it, anybody else can learn it. And we've put a lot of emphasis on doing that. And what we've done is, first of all, is go around and give talks. We actually started a fellowship and we've had two uh, of our fellows graduate that fellowship. So instead of doing a fellowship only in interventional cardiology, they do now a fellowship of a year of interventional cardiology and a year of lymphatics. Uh, and uh, we've done it now with two of our cardiac fellows and uh, we're going to be opening it for some of our intervention radiology fellows now. And we're hoping to establish this as a regular fellowship and then rotate or uh, alternate between interventional radiologists and interventional cardiologists who are learning these techniques. We've, got, we've gone to many places to, sh to talk and also to show them and also to help with cases. And we've opened the doors. So what we've done is just said, hey, anybody who wants to come and see what we're doing, the doors open, come. Mm -hmm. right? there, uh, unfortunately, COVID came and, you know, the doors <laughs> were shut down. Yeah. Uh, but we have a long list of people who wanted to come and uh, they are going to come and they're going to spend some time with us. And then what we do now is pay people who go back to their places and start a program up. Uh, we do these conferences with them online. I do this with people in Denmark, in, uh, in Austria, in India. And uh, we sit down uh, over, you know, Zoom is an amazing thing or uh, any of those other kind of things. And we get together and they show us what the imaging that they've done. We talk about the problems that they're facing and we help them analyze the imaging and give them recommendation for treatment. So all those things together, in addition to a website, an educational website that we are now building, are all those things that we are going to use to disseminate this knowledge. And uh, yeah, no, everybody has to do it. And the, the beauty about it is, again, is that the resistance to that, people now understand that this is extraordinarily important, that actually you cannot not do this if you're dealing with patients with congenital heart disease and especially those with single ventricles. So everybody now wants to do it. So this is happening. The programs are starting. Great, great point. Yes. And I think, and as these programs start, very similar to, to your experience and our experience here at, uh, in Philadelphia, once you begin to acquire uh, engagement with unique patients, you will learn and other centers will continue the, the evolution of these techniques as well. Uh, and you know, I think you'll probably agree that we will have done our job if uh, we learn something from some other center somewhere else that has done something novel with, uh, with the, the lymphatic Absolutely. circulation. So give, give me your, your view with all of that in mind, uh, where you think we'll be 10 years from now. Will we have lymphatic specific pharmacotherapies, will we have um, standards of, of treatment or uh, diagnostic regimens, as you've alluded to, that perhaps more selectively identify patients who may or may not be ideal candidates uh, for a caval pulmonary connection, you know, in some way. You know, I could imagine that uh, with uh, standardization of some of these diagnostic assessments, we may come to that conclusion that perhaps a particular class of patients are going to be much more um, uh, better off if they have some other therapy, like perhaps either transplant at that point, or that they undergo some pharmacotherapy and some training of the lymphatic system. I'm asking, I know multiple questions here, but and, right. and as well to think about this from the perspective of what can we do to prepare the lymphatic system perhaps to best deal with some of the stressors of, of a Fontan circulation? So, what yes, would you so that, that is an excellent question. So I can tell you from a personal perspective, 10 years from now, I'm hoping I'll be retired on a nice island. <laughs> <laughs> as I get well, older, I, as I get older, you know that looking, <laughs> looking more attractive. You're not that old. Your you're, you're, you're attractiveness, so so. But yeah, that was never there. But there you go. We'll, we'll, we'll accept it. But uh, from a lymphatic standpoint, so the th the things that you're asking actually were there already, 
right? Uh, we don't have to wait 10 years for that. We, we already have ways to screen for certain susceptibilities, right? We've developed all these imaging modalities. Uh, when you're saying, do we have therapeutics that target, I showed you that, right? We do. We now have therapeutics that are targeting lymphatic channels and causing them completely to regenerate, right? But this is just, again, this is opening a door, right? We have spent right, hundreds of years, 100 years, studying the cardiovascular system, developing therapeutics for the cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. There are more drugs for the cardiovascular system than I can name, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, every day there's another drug in another trial that shows a 0.1% efficacy, you know, for all kinds of uh, adult, uh, adult uh, heart failure problems. There's nothing on the lymphatic side, right? This is yeah. just the beginning. So absolutely, 10 years from now, right, if we do this correctly, and we have to, because we now know, we've seen it, we've shown it, that this is, plays such an important role in some of the problems that we are facing in our patient population, then we, we, we will have to, right, and it's happening. Like my friend Vivica in Denmark, she's working on these kind of things now and looking at what drugs do to lymphatic channels, uh, <clears throat> and many of the other people that are now getting involved, right? The research will start to come out, right? Many people need to get involved in order for all this to happen. And once we understand that it's important, then these therapeutics will come up. And yeah, absolutely, we will have the diagnostic tools and we already have them, right? We can screen a single ventricle patient with T2 imaging. It takes two and a half minutes and you will know if the patient is going to do well after the Fontan or is not going to do well after the Fontan. So that's one thing. In addition to that, and we, again, we, we, we gave this talk, right? There's the immunological component and the, and the transport component of the lymph system and, and other things that lymph system is playing a role in. And it is absolutely playing a key role, right? In the immune response for our heart failure patients, right? Mm -hmm. Something that you were interested in, the gut flora and, the, the, and what that does to uh, how our single ventricle patients uh, behave. And the lymph system is absolutely going to play uh, a role in that also. The microbiome. The yeah. microbiome, the correct. Microbiome. The microbiome, exactly. So all these things are things that need to be discovered. And again, remembering this is an organ system, right? For almost every organ system in our body, we have a division, right? We have a division of cardiology, pulmonary, GI, right? There's no reason why lymphatics should not at some point have a division or be part of a cardiac lymphatic division. We'll change our name and give, and give us a home with, within cardiology like we found because it is a circulation, right? But it is an organ system and that's how we need to treat it. That's what we said six and seven years ago, that that's what it is and that's how we have to think about it and that really has transformed. Uh, you know, the way we think in our understanding. And hopefully 10 years from now, absolutely, there will be either a division of lymphology or, or the divisions will be cardiac lymphology or vascular divisions that will treat these things. Yeah, the, the rate of generation of knowledge and the narrowing of the gap in this realm is, is accelerating. So that's, that is, that is uh, very, yeah. very valuable. Let me shift gears uh, for a minute here and in, in, our, in our final moments talk to you uh, for a moment about uh, something that perhaps some people don't know too much about uh, from your uh, personal perspective. And um, I'm curious to hear your, 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 your views on this and how you got started on this, but, but you're somebody who um, is a, a firm believer in meditation Correct. and in the notion of retreat. Correct. And in fact, I, I believe you've taken a couple of, uh, of periods of time where you've, you've gone to retreats. And uh, I, I think some of our listeners would be really interested to hear first how you got involved in this and, and why and how that happened. And, and really to what extent you're practicing this uh, and, and how you think it can, it can be conveyed to many of us who don't necessarily practice on a day-to-day basis, but the notions of what you're trying to achieve are so valuable. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so from so this is the other big part of uh, my life. Um, you know, I mean, you're asking the question is, is, from a certain viewpoint. I ask the question is, how could you not be doing this <laughs> at this point? How I got to this, I mean, p uh, part of the reason why, you know, this we, we've, we've did, we did this lymphatic uh, work is this curiosity, right? 
is not taking things for granted. And I always had that. That's always been kind of my thing, is this curiosity and, 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 and understanding ignorance and that humility that, OK, I, we don't understand almost anything about what's going on out there. But let's see if we can figure out you know, what actually is happening. So that was the initial thing that drove me into this. And then, you know, uh, you know I'm getting older now. I'm, uh, you know, uh, as I said, hopefully 10 years from now, I'll be in a nice beach. Uh, but as you go through life, right, certain things happen. All of us are going to have hardships that are, we're going to go through, right? And we all look for why these hardships are occurring, right? And, and not always getting great answers for that, right? In addition to that, right, as I was going through the process of everything I was doing, and before I did uh, cardiology, I was a, a, a chemical engineer. I did a PhD in chemical engineering. And, you know, I was going through the notion, just like all of us, right? We go through high school, okay, go to college, go to college. In Israel, we went to the army, and then I went to college. Uh, but I was doing that, and I finished my PhD, and, uh, and then I decided to do medicine, so I did that. And as I was going through all this, right, the promise that we are given, right, in, 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 in our world is that you just do all those things, right, and things are absolutely going to turn out to be perfectly fine, and, and you're going to get success, and somehow that success is going to be translated into wellness or happiness, right? And again, if you just look at things from an open mind perspective, then you clearly see that that's absolutely not the case, right? There are extraordinarily successful people, even billionaires on this planet, who have jumped out of windows because their mind is, you know, is not <laughs> experiencing the same thing, right? They're depressed, they're unhappy. Uh, so there's really doesn't seem to be a correlation between these two things, mm -hmm. right? Our world right now, is in a wellness crisis. And you can ask yourself, why is that the case, right? Because, you know, 15 year, 50 years ago, right, life expectancy was 40, 50 years, right? I mean, we were the, just got out of world wars, right? And before that, you know, people were, <laughs> were killing each other everywhere, right? Throughout history, For, sure. Yeah, yeah, throughout history, right? We had diseases, wars, all those things, and life expectancy was really low. From a material perspective, we are much better off these days than we've ever been, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people in the United States. There are, it does exist. Starvation does exist even in the United States, but it's not everywhere, right? It's not, it doesn't exist everywhere. So from a material perspective, we've gotten much better. And yet, right, there's a recent survey that came out of physicians, a wellness survey that showed that almost 50% of doctors experience what's called burnout, right? that they're just exhausted by doing what we were doing. Now, why is a doctor burned out? We're there to help people, right? We should never experience burnout from that, right? And this burnout crisis has translated into increase in suicide in doctors, mm -hmm. but this burnout is also part of what our entire society experiences, right? And there is a crisis of mental health out there, right? Depression, depression is, is high. I mean, just look at the surveys of medical students. Almost a quarter of them experience depression, yeah. right? And their, their burnout in them is much higher, right? But, and suicide and uh, depression in the general population, and especially in the young population, is now an epidemic, right? It is growing, right? So we have all this stuff, right? But at the same time, we are no happier <laughs> than we were there. And most of us are thinking, oh, my God, if I could just make life a little bit simpler, right, then, uh, you know, uh, we would actually be better off, right? So what, what, what do we do? What have if, what if you decided to do? Yes. So this is exactly it, right? And the introduction to this was, was during my PhD, I was lucky, I met two very close Indian friends of mine who were very spiritual. And a lot of these practices that I'll be talking about in a second do come from the East. Mm -hmm. And they came from India where this is, is commonplace, right? A lot of people practice this stuff, right? And we sat together during our PhD and I was interested and so I was listening and they were talking and then we started studying together about all these techniques. So this, this is this notion of meditation, right? Now in our part of the world, in the Western part of the world, meditation, has now been translated to mindfulness, mm -hmm. right? And mindfulness is really just paying attention to something. It is now that we, we use it. I mean, there are people in Wall Street that are using mindfulness to learn how to invest better, right? So they can concentrate better. And the fascinating part about this is that mindfulness has absolutely nothing to do with meditation, <laughs> okay? It is what? 
people in the East use in the beginning just to calm their mind down a little bit. But for example, His Holiness the Dalai Lama spends five hours a day meditating. He maybe spends 10 minutes a day doing mindfulness. <laughs> Everything else is doing other kind of techniques, right? These techniques of meditation, or what we've translated over here, mindfulness, and in a much more concentrated thing are this retreat, which I'll talk about in just a second, is just transforming the way that we look at the world. Mm -hmm. okay? You know, if I tell you, listen, Jack, we're going to go over the weekend and we're going to exercise like crazy. Okay? I mean, if you've seen this on TV, there are these people who do this thing that they crawl through the mud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's... Have you done it? Oh, no. Good. Oh, but not interested. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. But they do it. And they think it's the greatest thing. They literally torture themselves and crawl through the mud. But if you tell right, somebody who's going to exercise their muscles, they're going to do a triathlon, they're going to run a marathon, they're going to do all this stuff. Oh, great. Let's spend time doing that. Absolutely. You should exercise. We all know that exercise increases physical health, mental health, and all those things, right? Mm -hmm. How much time or how long do we teach people about how to do the exact same thing that we do with our physical muscles, with our mental muscles, with our mind, right? right. Meditation is exactly that. It is the practice of transforming our, medical, our, our mental muscles, our insides, right? In order to deal with really the most important thing in life, right? Is what your mind is doing, is how are you interacting with the world? And retreat, Right, which in our part of the world is a completely foreign uh, thing, right? Most people here don't even know what that means. What does retreat mean? I mean, are we going to a vacation? Is this going to be on some nice island and we're going to drink pina coladas? Retreat is, I think of that as the same as if you were an Olympic athlete, right? You would go to Colorado Springs and practice in a very isolated setting so you can concentrate on your, on, on your, on your whatever sport that you're doing. For meditators, uh, retreat is exactly that. It gives them a pause from the world, isolates them in an, air, in an environment that allows them to practice very intense mental practices. Right? And the question is, right, is why do we need to do this? Right? Do these things, and this is where the science comes in. Right? Do we need to do these things, or is this just all hocus pocus stuff? Right? I mean, I can go to the Barnes and Nobles, I can buy a book that says these are the second ste seven steps for happiness. It costs ten bucks, five minutes a day, and you're done, and life is good. Right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Right? If you want to be an Olympic athlete, you better practice your entire life, and if you want your mind to be healthy, then you're going to have to practice that. Right? Mm -hmm. But if you do that, right? then you are guaranteed that your outlook on life is going to be completely different. The way you live life, the meaning of life for you is going to be different. And actually the way that you are going to approach the hardest part of life, which is the dying part of life, is going to be completely, completely different. And absolutely, you will live a life that's going to be happier and better. And I've seen it. I know, what, I know exactly what that looks like. And that is available to everybody. But in order to get there, right? You have to practice. Sure. That's it. So, right. you're, I mean, it, there's a parallel to what we talked about earlier. To a degree, it's the tools. Exactly. People go through life. Correct. And there's this aspiration of understanding or trying to achieve everything you've just talked about. Right. But we don't have any clue as to how to explore that room, that area, unless we've got the tools Correct. that that allow us to then get the feedback of the positive benefits, reaping the positive right. benefits uh, of this type of activity. You know, if you're an Olympic, as you, using your metaphor, if you're an Olympic athlete, you train, you have a, a trainer that is going to help you, a coach to right. a degree, that can give you those particular tools, but then there's a regimen that's involved. Right. And all of that is missing for, for those of us that don't delve into this. So what, to, to briefly tell me, what, yeah. what specifically have you done? What do you do? Right on a regular basis. So just before we get to what I do, just one more thing. And though, uh, you are correct that historically we did not have the tools, but this is where the science has now kicked into this, right? And like you said, right, like the lymphatics, right? We needed the, the, the techniques and the science in order to start push this, show people that this actually makes a difference, right? And the great thing, the, probably the most important thing and the most important science, which was started really by a few people, but driven a lot by the Dalai Lama himself, 
and, and, and then taken up by a, 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 a person by the name of Richard Davidson in Wisconsin, is taking the scientific tools like functional MRI and studying the minds of people who are Olympians in internal exercise, all right? And the fascinating things about the science, okay, that it has now proven that these people are not crazy, that this is not some kooks that are sitting in an airport with, you know, you know funny hair and selling flowers, that this, their minds looks completely, completely different than our minds, and we now have the scientific tools to look at that, right? And we all have the possibility of getting there, and I can tell you again from hanging out with people like that, is that when your mind starts to look like what their mind looks like, their life is completely, completely different than our life in many ways. Okay? Mm. So what I do, okay, and so I do have a regular meditation practice. I usually meditate for somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes every morning. I do additional, usually meditation sessions in the evening when I get home. And I've done now several week-long retreats. I've done several uh, weekend retreats uh, with concentrated uh, practices. Um, I study a lot. Uh, that is also part of the practice, right? Is, to, is, is that ignorance and curiosity to understand, okay, and always ask the questions. Never take anything for granted, right? Mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't let anybody tell you, okay, this is, if you just do this, this is going to happen, right? It is really an internal investigation, right? So you have to have the curiosity. You have to have the drive to do it. And uh, my goal is that at some point, uh, I'll, I'll get to do a much uh, longer retreat, maybe a month long, three month long. Uh, you know, some of these people that I know have done retreats for 10 years, uh, some of them do it for even longer than that. Uh, so that of hopefully is the goal. But, you know, we live a very busy life, right? And I'm a physician, I don't have time to do a 10 year retreat right now. But even then, that's again where the science has come in and has shown, right? That even five minutes a day, right? I mean, how many of us don't have five minutes a day, right? Even five minutes a day of just a little bit of practice can make profound differences in the mind, right? And really, it's kind of around 20 minutes a day where you can really, really get profound changes. And how many of us would think twice about exercising for 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. None of us, right? But yet we think twice about this, right? But if you spend 20 minutes a day exercising your mind, right, your life can completely be transformed, right? So why not do it? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, Yoav, this has been a fantastic uh, couple of minutes that we've been able to share with you. And uh, I want to thank you so much for, uh, no for all the work that you're doing and that we expect you're going to continue to do. Yes. Indefinitely, although you'll, you'll decide the limit <laughs> yeah. on that. But uh, there's a wealth of knowledge that we're gaining that, that, that is helping uh, our patients. And, and thank you so much for sharing your, your personal insights uh, into meditation and retreat and, uh, and the potential benefits. And I'm, I, I'm certain our listeners will, uh, will scratch their heads for a moment, but then say, you know what, let me look into this because everything you've Good. said makes total sense. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yoav. And I want to thank you all for your attention and uh, for listening to this, this fantastic talk and, uh, and life lessons and life advice. Uh, we are very much interested in your feedback, and we'd love to hear questions concerning our content that you've heard, as well as suggestions for additional topics that would be of interest to have reviewed in depth and discussed. In order to communicate with us, we have a dedicated email address. It's chopheartalks at email.chop.edu. We'd appreciate hearing from you. We'd love to hear your ideas and suggestions. Thanks so much for your attention.